When it comes to quality sleep, Ashley has you covered with top mattress brands at winning prices and with special financing options available. You can snooze now and pay later. Plus, your mattress purchase helps give the gift of better sleep to children in need and U.S. Special Operations Forces. Visit your local Ashley store or shop online today and make every snooze count. Financing is subject to credit approval. See store or ashley.com for details. Rosetta Stone is the language learning program with a lasting impact. I've been using their app to learn French, and it's not just about memorizing words, but actually having real conversations. And it's not just French. They offer 25 languages. Right now, Rosetta Stone has an awesome holiday deal, 50% off their lifetime membership. Every language, unlimited access forever. For anyone keen on diving deep into a new language, check out rosettastone.com. It's a game changer. Welcome to True Crime Garage. Whatever you are, wherever you're doing it, I'm your host, the captain, and with me as always, a man that's back from vacation from the Del Boca Vista, the Crispy Colonel. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's good to be seen, and it's good to see all of you. This week, we are very proud to be featuring Midnight Rider Robust Porter by our good friends at the Piedmont Brewery and Kitchen in beautiful Macon, Georgia. This baby is black in color with ruby highlights. And if you love dark roasted malt, intense flavor, topped off with chocolate and coffee, this delicious porter is for you. Garage grade four and a quarter bottle caps out of five. And driving the beer truck to Garage Town this week are some of the Garage Army's best and brightest. First, a big cheers to Ava in Gordonsville, Virginia. And a big shout to Clay in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Next up, a cheers to my man, Chuck A. in Thompson Station, Tennessee. And a big shout out to Daryl and Ramona in Houston, Texas. Next, here's a cheers to Jen Z. in San Diego. Stay classy. And last but certainly not least, we have Matt, Angela, Danielle, Sam, and Cappy in Melbourne, Australia. And with the New Year, Captain, it is important to remind everyone and thank everyone that because of their continued support with things like our beer fund and the True Crime Garage store, it's because of that that we have been able to continue the garage's support of the National Center for the Missing and Exploited Children, the Charlie Project, and the Porchlight Project, all of which who are doing very, very good work. So cheers to them and cheers to all of you. Yeah, and for all of our supporters that have signed up on the mailing list, check your email this week because there'll be a discount code. And if you would like to sign up on the mailing list, go to truecrimegarage.com. And that is enough of the business. All right, everybody, gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. After graduating high school, Mara Murray, who was a good student and dedicated athlete, competing and excelling in track and field, she attended military school. Reports are conflicting as to why she left, but whatever the case, she left and enrolled in University of Massachusetts Amherst. On February 9, 2004, for reasons that are unknown, Mara Murray, who at the time was 21 years of age, left school and drove north towards New Hampshire. Sometime between 7 and 7.30 p.m., 
She was involved in a single car accident on Route 112 in Haverhill. Her father, Fred, believes that the car stalled when she was going around a turn and went into a snowbank. Mara knew this area fairly well and had been there several times before. She even called a place that her family had stayed at before, possibly to reserve a night or two for her to stay. However, no such arrangements were made. From what we have been told, her family and schoolmates do not know why she was driving there that evening. She was supposed to be at school, and her car was in no shape to be driving that distance. A bus driver who lived across the street from the accident, according to his statement, he spotted her car on the side of the road and offered assistance. Mara told him that she was fine and that she had already called for roadside assistance and they were en route. The bus driver called the police, but by the time authorities arrived, Mara had vanished. Some believe that she was walking or running east on the road. Mara vanished sometime after the accident and has not been seen since. Her father believes she may have met with foul play. Fred noted that she was in the middle of nowhere with no place to go due to her damaged car. He believes that she accepted a ride from a stranger who then killed her. Some believe she vanished voluntarily and does not want to be found. Another theory is that Mara wandered off into the woods and died of exposure. These are just three of many theories in this case. We featured Mara's case several times on both True Crime Garage and Off the Record. The strange missing persons case of Mara Murray is one of the more popular mysteries of the last 20 years, and unfortunately, Mara's case remains unsolved. Coming up on the 16th year anniversary of the disappearance of Mara Murray, True Crime Garage was able to sit down and talk with Julie Murray, Mara's sister. This interview is a long time in the making, and so we're glad to finally be able to do that and present it to everybody. And hopefully we're able to create a better understanding of who Mara was as a person, maybe clear up some misunderstandings or misreporting on some of the events of her disappearance. All right, Julie, it's good to talk to you. We met at CrimeCon. You were very excited to meet me, <laughs> as, as I was very excited to meet you as well. Uh, very intimidated by you because I haven't been doing my CrossFit. And I don't think you take a day off. Well, I was, you know, thanks for having me on. And I was a little intimidated by the line to meet you wrapped around the corner. Um, but I was very glad that I got a chance to meet you. And, you know, you don't need to do CrossFit every day. Um, <laughs> we talked about it. You'll get back on the wagon. Yeah, I think the line was to meet Nick. Uh, my line <laughs> was a, a lot smaller. So. Your sister went missing and has really become an internet sensation almost. Do you remember the first time or who told you that your sister was missing? Yeah, I I was at Fort Bragg, North Carolina uh, in the Army. I was a, I think I had just pinned on first lieutenant. I might have been a second lieutenant. We were actually getting ready to deploy to our to Iraq. And I think the call came in from Kathleen, my older sister, initially. And it was basically frantic, like, have you heard from Mara? And I told her, no, I hadn't. What's going on? And she said, she's missing. Her car was found somewhere in New Hampshire. She, it, it was kind of very frantic and vague, the first phone call. Um, and then later on, I remember talking to my dad and he was asking the same set of questions. And of course I had no idea where she was or what happened. So 
it was extremely stressful for me to be that far away and just sit by the phone and just wait for some answers. So that went on for the rest of that night and I was calling everyone and my mom was frantic. My whole family was frantic. And initially I said, dad, okay, I'm, I've got to get leave through the army so that I can come up and figure out what's going on. And he said, Oh, hold up. I'm going to go up there and figure things out. Right. So that was the initial notification that I received. Was there communication between the family about why Mara was where she was at? No one had a clue. Right. No one had a clue. So that was, that was the big thing. And that was kind of what caused us. Well, obviously that she, she was missing. We knew that that was her car. Um, but we kept asking, well, why, why is she there? And it was this big mystery from the minute that, that I got the phone call. Like it was a Monday night. It was during the school year. There was no reason for her that I knew at the time to be up there. And like you said, since the beginning, this case has had those two questions. One, why was she there? And then what happened? And I don't want to put words into anybody's mouth, but to me, it seems like a lot of these theories of why she would be up there have either gone nowhere or they just seem very far-fetched. Like you have to leap from A to uh, T to get there. Right. That's exactly right. And and that's I think that's part of the intrigue of the case is that we know so little. We don't know her motive for going up there in the first place. And then there are, there's such little evidence thereafter. Once we know that she did go missing, that just can boggle the mind. And it has, it's boggled my mind for going on 16 years now. You guys grew up playing sports together, but besides uh, running track, what sports did you guys actually play together? We played every single sport there is. <laughs> we played softball. We played soccer. We played basketball. We play. We made up sports. We played handball. We we played. Um, we used to watch America Gladiator. Oh, I don't yeah. know if you remember that show. Oh yeah. Yeah, it was a pretty pretty cool show. It was kind of like the the early two thousands version of American Ninja Warrior. Yeah for those that don't know. And I love that show. And so we would like try to recreate the feat of strength or an obstacle from that show and just battle each other. Did you guys ever try to build one of those tennis ball shooters? Remember, <laughs> remember the tennis ball shooter they had? Oh yeah. Those are so cool. Uh, no, but we, we didn't try to build one, but we did go to the batting cages um, quite often actually with my dad and, uh, we always had fun. We would practice together. We'd play together. We were usually on the same teams, like growing up in high school and cause the age difference is what? Yeah. So it was two and a half years. Yeah. So not that far. Yeah. Yeah. So pretty competitive with each other. Who was, who was better? Well, it depends on <laughs> what we were doing. <laughs> Mara was a better runner. For sure. I like to think I was a better uh, soccer player. A cool little story about Mara with basketball is she was so good at free throw shooting. There was a there was a basically a qualification for the state where you shoot 10 and the best out of 10 moves forward. And it was kind of a um, um, a big deal in Massachusetts. And she made it all the way to the state finals where she got to shoot free throws at halftime of the Celtics game. That's awesome. Yeah, pretty awesome. And so you were pretty jealous of that. I was really jealous. I was her ball girl. I well, I was thankful <laughs> that I was able to go and go out on, you know, on the the court for the the pre like before the Celtics even came out for the warm up. They the, they had the kids come in really early and I was her rebounder. <laughs> <laughs> But you know she wasn't ever going to let you live that down. Oh no! If no. I'm sure, if she was here with us right now, she would be telling you, "Oh yeah, you were my ball girl." So you guys are really close in high school, and then she follows you to college. 
Yeah. So I got into West Point and I, I went there um, two years ahead. She was still in, in high school. And then when she was getting ready to choose a college, she she applied to West Point as well, which is not not that easy to get into. And you have to get a congressional nomination and yeah. you got to go through a whole bunch of uh, tests and you it's not easy to get in it's it's very prestigious to get in yeah and so she she got in uh she also ran track with with me on the track team which was great because at west point everything's so structured and you don't have any time so we were able to see each other multiple times a day which is you know very rare um, for any other cadets that were siblings there that weren't on the same sports team. So well, better for her than you, because you've been there, you, I know, but yeah, you were paving your own path, but then your little sister gets there. Yeah. And it was so cool. It was so cool to talk about her when she was still in high school to my teammates at West Point, And then I would always tell them, you know, I hope she comes. She's an awesome runner. You guys would love her. And then when she was finally there, it was it was really cool. But yeah, so then your your father, which ever since uh, I started looking into your sister's disappearance, there's a bunch of different uh, I don't know assumptions about your dad, right? But uh, some people think it's strange that he pushed you guys so hard, or that's their words. But as a kid that played a lot of sports, there's been so many times where I've been reading about your father and I just think, why couldn't Fred be my dad? (laughs) Because to me, that just seems um, to an athlete or somebody that is competitive to have a parent be that invested in you. Uh, Is that a correct term Uh, or the correct way to look at your dad. Absolutely. And anyone that says that my dad pushed us or pushed us too hard does not know my dad because my dad did not push us. It was us. We pushed ourselves. Um, And this, that's just the nature of a distance runner. Distance runners have to push themselves. No one's out there on the lonely road with you at mile you know, seven of a 10 mile run, you're by yourself, you push yourself. That's just the mindset that distance runners have. And so, you know, I used to get upset when people said, you know, categorize my dad as kind of like a um, just mean authoritarian, just guy that was pushing us to the brink. That is so inaccurate. He actually told us to do less all the time. And both Mara and I wanted to get a job in high school so we could get a little, you know, spending right. money. And he's like, no, you're, you don't need a job. Your focus needs to be on schoolwork and having fun and running. You don't have time to add a job on top of that. Right. So, but you still wanted spending money. So did he give you guys some run around money? Well, if we asked, but, Mar and I, we never asked really for anything. Like our, the biggest thing we ever wanted was like crap food, candy, <laughs> pizza, um, or and cool like whatever the cool sweatshirt was, the champion sweatshirts or whatever. Yeah. But we didn't even care about that. Like we just we wanted to take it easy on him because we. Get, we had a big family and both my parents worked and they worked hard and we didn't have a lot of money. So we didn't want to, we weren't needy kids is what I'm trying to say. The time that you got to spend with your father doing that is invaluable. Yeah, absolutely. Like he, and he, he gave us the resources that we needed and the biggest resource was time, his time. Yeah. Um, and we spent hours and hours and hours on the basketball court trying to perfect our free throw, for instance, and, Clearly, Mar right. did that by making it all the way to the garden or um, perfecting our we used to uh, pitch fast pitch softball. We would spend hours doing that and we loved yeah. it. It's also free. It's free for a family that maybe doesn't have a lot of money. Exactly. So your dad had to be super proud of not just one of his girls, but two of his girls going to West Point. 
And so when she started at West Point, what was the, what do you think her energy was like? Well, she knew, she knew what to expect going in because I made sure she knew. And, um, a lot of what you do as a, uh, we call it a plebe. The first year cadet is just rote memorization and you've got to memorize all these different things and then you have to recite them. So I'm like, Hey Mara, here's my old plebe handbook start memorizing these things. It'll make your life easier. Right. You know, she did that. um, And so she, she excelled. I just don't think her heart was ever really in it once, once she got there. Well, that's hard for people to explain though, too, is you can go to a college that you looked into and, and visited and you did all these things. And then all of a sudden you get there and you just don't feel like you're, fitting in do you think she had any of that or was it just she was fitting in or could have fit in but she just didn't want to or yeah i think it's the latter i think she could have she she did fit in um she the schoolwork was no problem for her obviously the running she was doing great um she was the i think maybe the one or two top recruits coming in as a freshman as a sophomore she was she was beating me um, and, you know, beating the juniors and seniors on the team. She was, she was doing well. It's the military stuff that I don't think she enjoyed right. or definitely didn't enjoy as much as I did. Um, she was more, much more of a free spirit. Uh, I'm more structured. And so I like my routine and my everything in order. And she was a little bit less of, of that um, militant type. Yeah, clean room, messy room. You seem like the clean room. She seemed like the messy yes. room type. And so, so she, yes, she, was, she was a mess. <laughs> I know that has been talked about a lot on the internet. Is there anything that has been misreported about it or any anything that you want to talk about as far as the her time at West Point transferring over to the new school? Uh, yeah, I mean, well, well, let's just talk about the the issues at West Point. So some of the issues were d- the craziest things you could ever imagine. Like she she was at a summer training her second year down at um, Fort wow. Knox. And she was at what we call the uh, PX, Post Exchange. And it's just a place where people that live on the post or are visiting or are there for training, go and you get a discount on whatever it is. It's kind of like a Walmart for the army. Right. Um, and so she's in there and she walks out and the uh, military police person stops her and says, what's in your pocket or something. And she had, I think it was four or $5 worth of lip gloss, maybe mm-hmm. just in her pocket at the Fort Knox PX. So Mara was not an idiot. I don't know for sure why it was in her pocket. If she just forgot, you know, essentially it was, um, it was a problem because cadets can't lie, cheat or steal or tolerate those who do. That's our code. That's, you know, what we have to vow to when we first enter. Um, so anyway, she, she got caught for that. And then she had to go through a, what we call a honor hearing, cadet honor hearing. It's basically like a trial run by your peers, other Mm -hmm. cadets. Um, And it was stressful for her. I was part of the the trial as a character witness for her. And I remember going in to say, you know, she, I think she just forgot or she didn't mean it. If she was going to steal something, it would have been something more substantial than $4 lip gloss. Right. But on one hand, you can go, well, maybe that's why she didn't think it was so bad. It's $4. It's lip gloss. I'll just put it in my pocket real quick and just move on. Yeah. Well, that would be, I, I could see how you could think that, but she also had the money mm-hmm. to buy it. So I'm, I'm not sure what the motivation would have been. But what are you thinking in your head? Like, I mean, this is your, this is your baby sister. Yeah. I'm like, what are you doing? That's why would you do that? It doesn't make any sense. As she was kind of going through that whole process, it got to a point where it was just too overwhelming. Like she was having to miss classes and her, her grades were dropping and she was missing practices and it just wasn't fun anymore. And it wasn't, um, she just decided it wasn't for her. So 
she actually voluntarily left West Point after her second year. And so after your second year at West Point, you have to sign a or take an oath to serve in the military. So a lot of cadets leave after their second year because they, they decide at that point, hey, I don't think this military thing is is me. I don't think I'm cut out for this. Right. Um, and I think she realized, I think she realized that. So you, what you're saying is if you stay past your second year, you have to sign up to join the military. Yeah. Yo, yeah. You're locked in. They got, you owe five years. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Do you look forward to the holidays? Maybe you struggle with seasonal blues. This time of year can be a lot, and it's natural to feel some sadness or even anxiety about it. But adding something new and positive to your life can counteract some of those feelings. Therapy can be a bright spot, something to look forward to, to make you feel grounded, and to give you the tools to manage everything going on. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Find your bright spot this season with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash garage today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash garage. Rosetta Stone is the language learning program with a lasting impact. I've been using their app to learn French, and it's not just about memorizing words, but actually having real conversations. And it's not just French. They offer 25 languages. Right now, Rosetta Stone has an awesome holiday deal, 50% off their lifetime membership. Every language, unlimited access forever. For anyone keen on diving deep into a new language, check out rosettastone.com. It's a game changer. You can live out your MasterChef dream when you find a professional on Angie to tackle your dream kitchen remodel. Connect with skilled professionals to get all your home projects done well. Visit Angie.com. You can do this when you Angie that. All right. Cheers, me matey. Cheers to you, Captain. Yes, I am here in the garage. Mm-hmm. You hear me? And if you've listened to our little show before, then you know that all of our old episodes are available on the free Stitcher listening app. I am saying that because we have covered Mara Murray's case several times before. And if you want to listen to those, you can look up our coverage of Mara's case This is in episodes 28 and 29 from May of 2016, and also in episodes 152 and 153 from October of 2017. Now, where we left off, Captain, you are kind of getting into one of the biggest questions that that takes place early on in this case. One of the things out there that people have speculated on many times over, why would Mara leave West Point or was she kicked out? Did she get run out of there? Did she run out of there? What happened? And really, truly, this is what I love when we get the opportunity to speak to family members and to speak to people that are close to these cases. Usually you get a pretty simple answer to something that's been widely speculated. Right. And this is a very simple answer that makes a lot of sense. Okay. You're going to sign up. This is a hard and fast rule here. You're going to sign up for five years of military service. That sounds scary if your heart is not into it. And it sounds like Mara's heart was not into it. I did want to comment a quick thought that I had regarding the the theft of the lip gloss. Right. I don't want to question her sister too much regarding her thoughts and opinions on it because she was at the trial. What I find interesting there is that she still has questions about it, but she was at these proceedings where we have an opportunity for Mara to defend herself or shine a light on why was this item stolen from the, uh, from the, the little store there. I almost wonder if, if this is some kind of, not necessarily a cry for help, but almost a, 
I'm not really digging this because of maybe the military portion of what this education involves. Mm -hmm. Maybe was this a, a way out that wasn't so such a serious offense? You know, I'm not a bad person, but they have such strict rules. If I do something as small as this, maybe I am shoved out of here or maybe it gives me an out. Yeah. Or it could be just carelessness. I put something in my yeah. pocket. Didn't realize it was there. Walked out. Now, now I'm busted. Why did you steal this stuff? Well, I didn't steal the stuff. I just forgot it was there. And, and no matter how many times you tell somebody that and you go, well, here's the items back. I'm, you know, mm -hmm. I forgot it in my pocket. I've, I have forgot stuff in my pocket before. Uh, I just never got caught. But, when, you know, you get to your car and you're like, oh, crap. Why did I put that thing in my pocket? I don't know. I just did. So. Uh, well, and this, the store, the establishment, whatever it may be, can't very well just accept right. the, the idea of, oh, I put it in my pocket and forgot. Because if they just accepted that reasoning, they would have to accept that a hundred times a month right. and everybody would be putting things in their pocket and just forgetting. So yeah, it's one of those sticky situations. And I just wonder, you know, hearing Julie's thoughts on it, I almost expected to hear more of an understanding as to why it happened other than, I mean, cause really what, what I'm left with there is either she intended to steal it. And then what was the reasoning behind that? Was it that she is just plain and simple a thief? Yeah, I think, in the next little bit, she'll actually get to Mara's reasoning of or explanation of what happened. Okay. Okay. Because my other thought is that, is this just the, an excuse to get out? You know, is this just a minor offense that I could commit so that I can get out of something that I don't really want to do? If you had to guess what she would, let's say, uh, rate her freshman year, what do you think she would rate that as? Like a one to ten. Ten being the best, right? Her experience or how she, she did? No, like her experience. like. Yeah, I don't, I mean, she made great friends. Um, the track team was very supportive. I was there. I I think she did enjoy the schoolwork. It was challenging. So I would say like maybe a seven, like she wasn't like over overly thrilled. Like I was like, just want right. to walk around in my uniform all day long. Cause I just love it. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> she was kind of, I felt like she was kind of over it. Like it's a lot. It's a lot. It wasn't like she went there and had a nine or a 10 freshman year and just, it was the best year ever. Then all of a sudden this dark cloud came over her. No. No. And and then sophomore year was so bad and No, I think I think she it, it just solidified what she already knew from the beginning. Like I I'll tell you this this one time the the very first summer cadets have to go through what's called beast barracks and it's the cadet version of basic training. Right. But it's like basic training on steroids because not only are you getting beat up physically, but you're also having to memorize all of these things that I talked about earlier and you're like eight, 17, 18, 19 years old and you're away from home and it's so stressful. And I loved it. <laughs> Mar did not love it. I remember I was also, I was one of the trainers. So my job as a, when I was going into my junior year was to train these new cadets coming in and she was one of them. And I dropped into her room one night just to check on her. And I think I brought her, I was bringing her Oreos or, or something because you don't get to eat a lot. And right. I just found her just crying and yeah. just totally just unhappy. And this is the, this is before she even started the academic year. Right. And it, it, I didn't, that was the first glimpse into seeing that, she wasn't happy it's like you said it's tough too when you're enjoying so many aspects of that life right and i 
I told, I kept telling her when I went through that, I'm like, it's so awesome. Like these people will yell at you and you'll, they'll tell you to do push ups and you'll like be the best because you're in the shape and you'll do these push ups and then they'll yell at you more. And <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, maybe I'm a sadomasochist, but I liked it. And so maybe I gave her the wrong impression. She did not like it. <laughs> well, no, I mean, but also just because you're a very good athlete different athletes are motivated by different things. And like you said, you, you feel like you are motivated uh, with your life with structure and, but she might have been uh, motivated more by, and I don't want to use the word chaos, but disorganization. So that is, yeah, that is true. Chaos is the right word for her. (laughs) You're like, no, no, stick with the chaos word. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, I'm Fred. My two amazing daughters, they're smart, they're good looking, they're they're very athletic, and they go to West Point. I mean, it doesn't get much better than that. And one sophomore year, which like you said, the the but the stealing and I don't even is that what your family considered the lip gloss? but we'll call it the lip gloss incident. Is that what the family considered it stealing or was it just, she just didn't know it was in her pocket. I really think she just got distracted. And 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 so, and that's what she told me. Right. And I believe, you know, I believed it. Why else would she, I don't understand why she would try to steal from a place where she knew that there was people watching for that type of thing. And at this point is when she, like you said, she went to the, the trial that was, it's all pretty much conducted like with in house. And I don't even know, do you want to call it a trial? Well, we call it an honor board. So it's, I mean, I no, I don't want to call it a trial. It's yeah. It's like an honor hearing, but this is where she'll meet her boyfriend, Bill Roush. Yes. That is where she met Bill. So then mama bear has to come out, right? And and what do you think of her boyfriend? Yeah, absolutely. So Bill was Bill was actually 2 years older or two classes ahead of Mara and which makes it would make him my classmate at West Point. So Bill was my classmate and I didn't know Bill all that well, although it's pretty small. There's only I think my class is only like 900 people. I knew of him. I hung around in the same circles as him, um, but I didn't know him that well. Um, but then when the honor board kicked off and he was helping Mara, like tremendously helping Mara, I thought he was a good guy. So your spidey senses were telling you that this guy was okay to date your sister. Yeah. And I was a little skeptical because he was two years older and he was my classmate, but I was, I mean, he, that was okay. I mean, in the grand scheme of things, there it was probably I don't know how old Bill is now, but it's not that big of an age difference whatsoever. Right, right. So, no, there was nothing that there was nothing that I outwardly disliked about Bill. Well, I think that it, it, it's interesting to me cuz like you said, I think that's a key thing that maybe the inter- internet has missed upon is that she's leaving this school and i think the number one reason would be that she wouldn't want to sign up for military duty yeah that's the reason you must not want to sign up for military so much because you have a lot of things there at that school going for you have you have athletics that you're excelling in you're doing well in school i mean yes less in your sophomore year your sister's there and she's cool, right? I don't know. If she, well, I'm, I'm trying to. I'm trying to butter yeah, you up right now. I don't know if she would call me cool. And she's really <laughs> awesome. And uh, but then you have your boyfriend there. Yeah. And so it's kind of a big thing, right? You go, okay, well now she's switching schools, and that's going to make a lot of things harder. But I don't know. I'm, my gut feeling is just I had to do it myself. And it was tough. It was a big deal to switch schools, but what a relief it was 
once I got to a school that I felt like I belonged. So now she gets, she starts the next year on time. Is that correct? Well, she transferred her, she attempted to transfer all her credits from her classes at West Point, but I think that put her behind a semester um, Mm -hmm. at UMass. So I think she went into UMass at, a half a semester behind where she would have been at West Point. The other thing I want to say about that is she, she, she switched basically universes. She went from West Point chemical engineering, military career to a, she got into the nursing program. Those those are polar opposite things. Yeah. But a nursing program is very uh, difficult and time consuming. Maybe the, the level of math and certain things like that aren't going to be as high, but it's a very time consuming major. Yes, I definitely agree there. And it, and it's a definitely a hard program, but the careers are, 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 are opposite. I mean, you're, you're going to war or you're going to go help people. I mean, let's talk about a couple of situations she gets into there. The credit card fraud. So, um, at UMass, I, Mara was using a another person's credit card to purchase um, random things like pizza from Domino's and subs and stuff. Right. So I don't, I didn't really get what all that was about, but other people have told me that that she wasn't the only one doing it. And I'm not saying that that makes it right, but I'm saying if if you really start to think about it. Who is that important to? Why is that important that she was doing that? Yeah, but I think by showing these actions or these questionable states of behavior that it allows people to create a narrative. Yeah, I agree. And you've got to, you got to kind of peel it back and look at who are these people focusing on these small little details and what is their motive? Why is it, like I said, why is that important? Is it important to where Mara is? Is it important to why she went to New Hampshire on that Monday night in the grand scheme of things? Maybe, but I don't think so. Um, But, you know, it kind of brings me to the point of you've got this, cast of characters that are obsessed with this case and um, some of which are using it for, for profit uh, for some of them need content or some of them need to pick apart some of the stuff that a 21 year old girl did in college to be relevant. And, you know, we could, we could pick apart every little thing that you and I did when we were 21 and, it probably look a lot worse than what Mara did. I mean, I don't want to speak for you, but I mean, I did some really dumb stuff. Yeah, but you also had a clean room. But I did have a clean room. Yeah. You know, so, I mean, once you have a clean room, they pe- people trying to write books or people trying to start podcasts, if they see a clean room, they just keep moving. Yeah. They go, oh, nothing to see here. Yeah, exactly. Um, what I'm trying to do is to get a sense of where you think she was at and her life, how she thinks, how you think things were going. Because I know with siblings, I hear about the ebbs and flows. And, and, and sometimes your parents will tell you, Oh, things aren't going so well. So then you reach out and check in with your brother or sister and find out, Hey, things are not actually that bad. Or they tell you things are great. And then you check in and you go, Oh, things aren't (laughs) that great. But to me, it seems like things are, she's doing a lot better and she's heading in the right direction. Yeah. And one of the things that, that I can say about that is um, she was doing really well in the nursing program. She was on the track team. She had a a group of girlfriends that she hung out with. She kept in touch with her friends from high school pretty regularly um, more than, than I ever did. Um, But the other thing is she was uh, an athletic tutor. So she was a tutor for other athletes. You don't just become an athletic tutor if you've, you're a mess. You know what I mean? Right. 
<laughs> so yeah. um yeah. I don't know what the selection process was or how you got to be a, a tutor but um she definitely was one and um, she must she have met some kind of qualification yeah exactly um and she she actually had a an appointment or a session i don't know what it's called the week that she went missing um that she didn't show up to obviously because she was missing um so i'd be interested in trying to f- track down who that person was she was supposed to tutor was that session supposed to be on that Monday? I'm not sure the exact day, but I know it was that week. Yeah, because that's the other thing that is kind of unclear is she, you know, so things are going pretty well. I know there's these these phone calls that she gets at work. She seems a little upset. So one of her bosses walk her back to her dorm. Do you know who that call was to or what it was about or? Yeah, so that call was um, with my older sister, Kathleen, to the best of our knowledge, from what we know from phone records and talking to to everyone um, that spoke to her that night. Um, So she had a call with my older sister, Kathleen. Basically, Kathleen had just gotten out of rehab um, for um, alcoholism, and her husband at the time picked her up from rehab and took her directly to a liquor store. And Kathleen was telling Mara that. So my thought is, you know, that call was earlier in the night. I think it was about 10, 10 PM ish. um, And Mara Mm -hmm. was at her security desk job where she would check people's IDs to get into the dorm room at UMass. And she hung up the phone with Kathleen um that way also another job that they don't give to people that are barely making it by (laughs) exactly yeah struggling to get through school yeah yeah and that was one of her jobs she had she had another job so she had two jobs uh Mm. so she was she was on the go like she was doing a lot how mad was how mad was your dad about her having two jobs well, I don't even know if my dad knew, <laughs> to be honest. Right. Um, but I know he knew about one of them, but I'm not sure if he knew. Uh, she worked at an art gallery as well. I'm not sure if, if he knew about that. He probably did because he loves art and stuff like that. But, yeah, so she gets his call. That's pretty upsetting. It's a pretty upsetting call um, to get from your sister who you care about. And for that to happen, um, Kathleen was probably – upset and disappointed in herself and felt like a failure. And I know Mara was the type of person that would have tried to be stoic and calm Kathleen down and, and, you know, be that rock for her. So right. I was just going to say that sometimes you can be a rock for the person on the phone, but when you get off the phone, then you, you have to um, let out that sadness or that negative energy yourself. Absolutely. And so that's kind of what I think happened. I think it really upset Mara, that that phone call with Kathleen. And I think she wasn't able to release any of those emotions with Kathleen in the state that she was. And so she she probably, and she was at her job. um, So she didn't have this breakdown until later towards the end of her shift where maybe she couldn't hold it together any longer and you know, like you said, you can't hold that in. And Mara was, was emotional. Um, and so she just had this breakdown to the point where the student boss, I guess you'd call it, um, came or was notified and came to where Mara was sitting and basically escorted Mara, um, back to her room. The other thing that people question a lot is that that your dad came to visit her the weekend before she went missing. Yes. Um, my dad came up from Connecticut to visit Mara and the purpose of his visit was to buy a new car, not a new car, a u- a new used car from Mara. Right. New to her. New yeah. to her. Yep. Yeah. Um, that's, that's what kind of cars <laughs> we got too. <laughs> I, I don't, I didn't know what a new car was. Yeah, uh, exactly. I was like, you mean somebody else's car? <laughs> I believe they went and looked at some cars 
uh, and possibly called around, but there wasn't anything that he was particularly in love with. Well, actually, no, that um, they did find they fi- they narrowed down they narrowed it down to two two cars mm-hmm. that weekend. They they went to several different locations. Um, Mara's uh, boyfriend Bill actually bought a car somewhere at at one of the locations that they looked at himself, and so they went there and they Bill, Bill Roush bought a car. Yep. During this trip. No, 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 no. Before, prior. Bill bought, okay. bought a car at a previous trip to UMass to visit Mara. Okay. Yep. So Mara and my dad went to that location to say, hey, do you, let, let me see what your inventory is. What do you have? They found right. one vehicle that was kind of in the right price range. I That vehicle was, um, I want to say, $4,000, I believe. Then they went to another location. This is on that Saturday. Uh, and they found another car, which was a better car. I can't remember the brand, but I know it was red. Um, but that car was $6,000. And that's the car that my dad wanted to get from R because it was a little bit, it was a better brand or something. I'm, it might have been a, I don't know what kind it was. But anyway, what? my dad only, my dad deals in cash um, because when you're trying to go deal with used car salesmen, cash is king. And so he oh had this. Oh my God, you sound like my father. <laughs> Cash is king. Cash is king. Yes. Yes, I know dad. I know dad. I mean, and you, my dad's a, pr- a pretty skilled negotiator when it comes to dealing with those old school type of guys that typically work at uh, used cars places. Yeah, but back in the day, car, car dealerships were different. You And you could also, you couldn't just call your bank and tell them, run my card for six grand. No. There was limits and stuff like that. So the fact that he'd be dealing with cash makes the most sense in the world. But a lot of people then have taken this idea that they were going to go look for a car, which like if you had to rate her car at one one to ten, what would you rate it? It was like a two. It was it was trash. <laughs> it was not good. Right. And so they're going up to get a car, but then there's been all this speculation that your father gave her this money, which there's, I can't find proof of that, that he gave her the money. And then they say that she was pregnant and that's why she's been missing all these years. Cause she was pregnant and she was, and your dad was helping her run away. Yeah. That's just crazy talk to me. That's someone that needs to, Need some content or <laughs> needs to make this sensationalize this. That is not what happened. And um, just as some background, like my dad deals in cash and not only with card, you know, dealing with cars, he just, he always has cash all the time. Right. And I guarantee you when he was looking at those cars, he, I'm, I'm pretty sure he probably flashed his cash in front of whoever it was to try to get a, you know, a, a better deal on the car. Um, and listen, his, his bank was in Connecticut and it's not like, it's not like they had SunTrust and, I don't know, Bank of America. Um, right. yeah. So it's not like There's he could just get a bunch of cash out from anywhere back then. Actually, I think his, his bank account might've been out of east or yeah eastern mass but whatever it wasn't it wasn't near umass um and so he had limits on how much you could withdraw he knew he wanted the cash because to incentivize the dealer to give him a better a better deal the bottom line was he wanted to get more the more expensive car and he didn't have the the other two thousand dollars so he told her i'm going to come back next weekend and we're going to get you this car the other reason right. why time was of the essence for her to get this car was be- part of her nursing program required her to go to clinicals. And so she had to travel to all these different hospitals for these clinical rotations that she had. And part of the the process with that was she had to confirm that she had reliable transportation, which she did not. Um, so she she needed this car to go to these clinicals because she was just bumming rides from her classmates. You can only miss so many 
uh, clinicals. These are huge in a nursing program. And some places that you can't even miss one. Uh, If you miss one, you have to do a makeup. So to miss one uh, could have been a big no-no. Yeah, absolutely. And she was doing so well in the program. I don't think she wanted to take that risk. Um, And it, this is just speculation on my part, but she could have told her professors she needed time off uh, and there was a death in the family so that she could buy some time to get this new car um, and not basically lie and say for whatever reason she had to go. And it could have been to take care of her reinstatement fee in New Hampshire, which she knew she had a, she got a speeding ticket in New Hampshire the um, couple months prior to her going missing. Um, So it kind of all kind of comes together into a, a theory that that's why she was going up to New Hampshire in the first place. All right. So let's, okay, let's stay on that for a second. So, and I believe this is like new information that, that for 15 years, we've wondered why she was there and then what happened. And I believe we have the most plausible reason of what, why she was there. So your dad comes to visit He's going to buy her a car. They find one, but it's not the car that she wanted. So now she decides that she is going to, she's going to go to an area that she went on vacation with uh, your father and Bill. And during that time, she got a speeding ticket. Yes. And so she then didn't pay the speeding ticket. No, she she did pay the speeding ticket. She actually mm-hmm. she was required to appear because she got a ninety nine. The speeding ticket was ninety nine miles per hour, so it was pretty pretty fast. So right. She had to appear and pay a pretty hefty fine, which she paid the fine for the speeding, but they she never paid the reinstatement fee, or we don't know whether she's paid the reinstatement fee. Right, so the, it looks like they probably suspended her license for a time period, and then they wanted her to pay a reinstatement fee. Right. And then so she didn't pay that fee. So so you believe that on that Monday when she then tells her school and work and everybody, look, there's a family emergency, and uh, i got to take care of this, and then I'll be back. So the thought is that she was going to drive up there Monday, either pay, then stay somewhere, and then go back to your father's house? Well, yeah, it was my mother's house at the time. But that, yeah, that's sort of what the the theory is. But basically, she she got into an accident that, that Saturday night prior um, to her going missing on Monday after they, her and my dad went car shopping. And so... The thought is that's when she learned that she had a suspended license that required her to show up in person in New Hampshire to pay a reinstatement fee because I'm not sure how else she would have known that her license was suspended in New Hampshire. So although her license wasn't suspended in Massachusetts, you know, if the, the officer at the accident and Hadley on that Saturday would have run her license. Um, he may have seen that and just said, Hey, right. you know, you have this issue. Yeah. And the accident on Saturday, she just ran off the road. Yeah. She just slid off the road. She just, yeah. Ran off, went into a T she was at a T intersection and just went straight forward and hit the guardrail. So then she, she is driven back by the police officer to your father's hotel because he's visiting trying to help his daughter get a car. Yeah, well, she 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 jumped in the tow truck. The, the officer on the scene did not cite her for DUI. She, she He let her go. Um, mm-hmm. She didn't get any, she didn't get anything, and he allowed her to jump in the tow truck, and the tow truck took the car, the my dad's Corolla, to wherever they take it, which happens to, which happened to be right next to where my dad's hotel was. And so she right. jumped in and just went to the hotel. So, okay. So have you talked to your dad about this? Did he, did he think she was intoxicated? 
Because you said she didn't get a DUI or an OMVI. Yeah, so I mean, it's pure speculation. That who can say? Who can say whether she was intoxicated or not? Right. Um, she Obviously, a not for the not enough for the officer to think that she deserved to be arrested for it. Yeah, and I mean, we're talking about UMass. It's <laughs> I would say over half the student body is intoxicated on Saturday night. Um, mm-hmm. But that, um, you know, I'm not, I think that doesn't mean that. they should be driving though. Yeah. Joy. Oh, absolutely. I yeah. totally agree with you. And even if, even if she was overtired, she shouldn't have been driving. Um, right. But yeah, I totally agree with you. But I think the police officer, like I said, if it, if it was apparent, she's been heavily drinking. He's not going to let her off like that. No, I just, I don't buy that for one minute. So he lets her go back. How about you just jump in the tow truck and then go back to your dad's hotel. And the, the, another thing about the internet that, I mean, with this case, and I find this just absolutely uh, appalling and disgusting is, is some of the stuff that people then have speculated or assumed because Fred has a hotel and his daughter's going to stay in the hotel with him. How has that kind of speculation you know, against your father. Uh, I just don't even want to say the words. I don't want to rehash what they're spe- speculating, but I mean, how, how does that affect you? I mean, it's just sick. It it really is because number one, um, there was two beds in that room. Right. And it, it's really upsetting because obviously whoever's spreading this does has, doesn't know my dad. Um, and to say those things about a father with a missing child is nothing other than sick. And there's, yeah. there's gotta be a motive behind why anyone would say that. And I think it's pretty clear what the motive is for any, for whoever's saying that. So she ends up talking to your father, your sister ends up talking to your father, talking to her boyfriend that night. Well, let me let me just clear the record on that. So when she got back to the hotel room in the tow truck, she couldn't get into the his room. Um, so she actually kind of dozed off on the couch in the lobby of that hotel. Right. So she didn't have a key to the room. And I don't know whether she didn't want to wake my dad or there was maybe a lobby um door that you had to have a key to the room to get in. I'm not sure the exact circumstances, but my dad didn't know that anything even happened until the next morning um, when he woke up. Um, Somehow she, I guess when the, the um, front desk person came, I don't know if it was man 24 hours or whatever, somehow she got to access to my dad's room later on in the morning. And she used his cell phone to call Bill and tell Bill what happened. And then that's when she told my dad what happened. She has a cell phone. We know she has a cell phone, but it's possibly dead at that point. And then, well, she left it. She left the cell phone at the dorms. Right. So she didn't have her own cell phone. It was so nice back in the day when we could do that. (laughs) Just leave the, just leave your cell phone at home. You don't need it. Yeah, I think we'd all freak out. <laughs> well, I mean that, but but here's another point that I think it's interesting for people to hear is there's tons of people that have investigated the, this case. There's tons of people that have looked at this case, and to just talk about the time that she gets in a wreck on Saturday and then she goes back to the hotel with her father. And I have never heard that she actually had to go to the lobby first and sleep on the couch. Yep. I mean, this is the misinformation that gets put out there. Not for every case, but for a lot of cases, there's little. And and does that have anything to do with her going missing? Probably not. But it's just to show that not all details or things that are people are reporting should everybody take as fact. I agree. And I think that my kind of rule of thumb with this is to... to figure out the motive behind why people are saying certain things. And it's right. been 16 years and, you know, I've figured out there, there's a few loud voices surrounding this case 
um, and their motives are pretty uh, apparent. Um, and so I don't really let that that type of stuff really get to me and distract me from what Doing my what mission you're... is and my motive, which is to find my sister. So you're so you're telling me that she's not pregnant, and your father's not paying for her to start a new life. <laughs> Yes. I can't believe I have to say this. Um, yes, that's what I'm saying. The four thousand dollars was to buy her a new buy her a car that actually ran with all right. cylinders firing. <laughs> and she th- so there's I, I have to address it. I can't believe I do. But the rumor about the pregnancy um issue is that sh- her computer showed searches for pregnancy terms, maternity terms. Mm-hmm. And that's because her homework assignment was she was going through a maternity cycle. And so her literal homework was to look up maternity terms. Julie, that sounds a little too convenient. I mean, I mean, it's not a good story. It's not it's not salacious. And it's yeah. And and also she was on birth control and the birth control, she had four pills missing out of the, her current pack of birth control. Right. That was found. One of the items found in her car. So, and the other thing too, is there's been multiple accounts that after the first year of her going missing, your father's up there every weekend. And then it, I think then he kind of goes down to every other weekend. And then eventually every three weeks he's going up there, but that's, that's, yeah, that that's hurtful. That is really hurtful for me to hear stuff like that because I sat there and I watched my dad for 10 years. I mean, we're going on 16 years, y'all, but for 10 years, that man, that poor man drove up to New Hampshire from whether he was in Connecticut or down at the Cape at the time, most, sometimes and most of the times all by himself on that lonely road. And I just can't imagine. I wish I could have been there on some of those trips with him. I just can't imagine what he's thinking for four hours in his car. And then for people to say, well, he didn't go up there enough. That man could not have gone up there any more than he, he did. And it, it's really hurtful for me to hear stuff like that. Every weekend. I mean, I, you have to make a living. You have to pay your bills. And then every weekend you're going. And that's that is not coming from, I did not hear that from anybody in your family. I heard that from uh, volunteers, people that were helping him. And then to continue to do that every year. And continue to do that every weekend when you're finding no new information. I mean, that I think there's a level of love and care that you just naturally have for somebody in your family. And if he didn't have that for your sister, there's it would be impossible to do what he did and the amount of searches and the hours he searched and the amount of money he spent searching. Yeah, and I mean... And like I said before, all by himself most of the time. I was in the army or in you know in my government job and wasn't able to to get up there as much as I would have liked. When he went up there, all he hit was roadblocks. He just hit roadblock after roadblock. And two years into the case, after hitting all these roadblocks, the man who supposedly took four thousand dollars out to help Mar run away is pleading for the release of all the records at the New Hampshire Supreme Court pleading to get the FBI involved. Now, what man who's trying to help his daughter escape pleads for the FBI? And also with the speculation out there that she was that she ran away to start a new life because your father was sexually abusive or physically abusive for her to get in a crash on that Saturday and then tell the police officer Ah, don't take me to my dorm. Take me to my father's hotel. That doesn't make a lot of sense to me. We're we're, we're getting logical here. I don't I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if the internet can handle that. <laughs> but then the abusive person that is abusing the person because they don't care about them cares so much that they go search for them by themselves. It, it, there's just no logical sense, nor is there evidence, and that's the thing that has really drove me nuts about people talking about your sister, people that claim that they're looking for your sister, people that claim that they're they're they have a that they're doing this for good, uh making accusations and speculations with no evidence. And so so that so that Monday we believe that she was going up 
with this with the new theory that I believe is based off of actual evidence that she was going up to that area to pay pay that ticket. Yeah, and I'm not married to any theory and I'm not pushing a theory. I don't know where Mara is. I don't know what happened to her. I'm open to, I have to be open to all possibilities and all theories. Um, Not wild speculation, but based on what we do know, um, we can kind of narrow it down a bit. Um, But like I said, I'm not, I'm not convinced that this is the theory and I'm going to, you know, push this narrative. Um, But it's possible. It's possible. I just haven't heard that many logical reasons why I should be in that area. And this, to me, sounds like an actual logical reason. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I definitely agree. I, I wish I knew. I wish I, I knew the answer to why she was there. I wish somebody did. I wish she would have told somebody. Like I said, like before, I've, I've said it so many times. It doesn't make, it doesn't make sense for her to be there, and it wasn't smart, and she wasn't supposed to drive the Saturn. And she didn't drive the Saturn when my dad was around because he, right. she knew that um, he'd get her for it and say, so what this are you is doing? Also, this is also why he said, hey, while I'm at my hotel not using my car, why don't you use my car? Go, go hang out. Use my car. Exactly. But I will say that I do know that occasionally, I guess when she couldn't find any other person to, to take her where she needed to go, she would jump in the Saturn and drive it short distances um, because right. in one of her emails to her um, high school friends, she referenced getting stuck in the snow in her s- stupid Saturn, or I don't know what term she used. So she jumps in her Saturn. She's going to go. We know that she stops at an ATM. We, th- that footage was finally released. I think the biggest thing about them releasing the ATM footage was you not knowing if you've seen the jacket that she was wearing. Part of part of that statement, I mean, when you when I'm on the Oxygen show and I'm saying that and I'm I'm looking at the computer screen that they put in front of me, that is the very first time in my entire life that I had seen that. And I was trying to hold it together. I was really just trying to say something. Um, and I don't know what made me say that, but it's true. I mean, I didn't recognize a jacket, but I was in such shock and it, it it's a hard thing to, to, it was a hard thing for me to see, especially with cameras all over me and I'm trying to play it cool and be like, you know, not get super emotional. Um, and so I'm like, I don't recognize a jacket. I'm like, why did I say that? That's not an appropriate thing to say, but it was right. true. It's just where my mind went. Um, but that was that was hard. Yeah. It's also emotional because you have been through so much and your family has been through so much. And then you get to see this picture and that's the last known recording of her. Yeah, and I've stared at those pictures, I've analyzed those pictures, I've zoomed in and zoomed out just to kind of like try to read her expression, try to figure out her state of mind because I knew Mara better than anyone. And the the unfortunately the still shots that we were shown are pretty bad quality. Yeah. Um, I can't tell you how how many times I've stared at those pictures because it it literally is the the last time I've I'll see her. Thank you to everybody for joining us here in the garage today. Join us back here again tomorrow for much more on this case. Until then, be good, be kind, and don't listen. You can live out your master chef dreams when you find a professional on Angie to tackle your dream kitchen remodel. 
connect with skilled professionals to get all your home projects done well. Inside to outside, repairs to renovations. Get started on the Angie app or visit Angie.com today. You can do this when you Angie that.